Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 20th virtual YMCA education series program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I am a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. We are recording this evening's presentation so that you can revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your family and friends about it so that they too can view it on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites. Tonight's program entitled, What is Hip Arthroscopy? will be hosted by Dr. Michael Q. Arthroscopic hip surgery is a minimally invasive procedure that involves two to three small incisions, a high definition camera, and specialized instruments to work inside the hip joint. Arthroscopy is used to diagnose and treat a wide range of hip problems, including removing or repairing torn labrums, ligaments, and damaged cartilage, treating hip impingement syndrome, treating snapping hip syndrome, addressing diseased or inflamed lining of the hip joint, bone spurs, and more. Tonight, Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's Michael Q, MD, FAAOS, will explain what hip arthroscopy is, what happens during hip arthroscopic surgery, and why and when it is advised for patients. Dr. Q is a sports fellowship trained and board certified orthopedic sports medicine surgeon specializing in advanced non-surgical treatment to minimally invasive surgery of the hip, knee, shoulder, and elbow. He uses cutting edge techniques in tendon repair, complex ligament reconstruction, cartilage restoration, and joint preservation. As a sports team physician who has treated intercollegiate, professional, international, and Olympic athletes, returning numerous patients back to sports with or without surgery, Dr. Q has the experience to treat adult and pediatric athletes at all levels and draws on a full armamentarium from injury prevention and rehabilitation, performance enhancement and regenerative therapy to arthroscopic or open surgery when needed. To complement his medical expertise, he has the personal background to understand the competitive drive having played on and later coached an Illinois State Championship High School varsity soccer team. Plus, Dr. Q served on the team of physicians to the Chicago Bears and is currently the head team physician for the Schomburg Boomers, a local baseball team in the Frontier League, who this past weekend became the 2021 Frontier League champions. Dr. Q is an active fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the Arthroscopy Association of North America. He graduated magna cum laude from Loyola University, Chicago, obtained his doctor of medicine degree with honors at Chicago Medical School, and finished his internship and orthopedic residency at Henry Ford Hospital. He completed the orthopedic sports medicine fellowship at the prestigious University of Chicago. And if all those accolades don't sway you, listen to these two of many reviews I found for him online. Dr. Q is honestly one of the best doctors out there. He always explained all my options so I could make an informed decision about what was best for my wrist. I ended up needing surgery, but the outcome was great and now I'm back to normal. Scheduling appointments was always very easy and they always had availability to work with me around my time. Very organized as well. Chef's kiss, five stars, 10 out of 10, recommend. And this one, after experiencing on and off hip pain for several months, I finally saw Dr. Q. After examination, x-rays, and an MRI, I was diagnosed with greater trochanteric pain syndrome. After six weeks of his rehab program, I have no more hip pain and am feeling 20 years younger. Wish I would have come in sooner. Thank you, Dr. Q. During Dr. Q's hip arthroscopy presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. When you have questions for Dr. Q, simply type them into the question section on your screen and I will receive them and relay them to him at the end of the program. I ask that you please keep your questions related to hip arthroscopy and general, as in non-specific to your particular condition, as Dr. Q will not be able to address individual <coughs> concerns without individual consultation. If you submit a question, we'll do our best to answer it, but remember if it's too personal, I may not be able to include it for the doctor to address. Please also understand that we received many, many questions and may not be able to address them all in the time allotted tonight. One last thing before I turn the evening over to Dr. Q. I invite you to mark your calendars for Thursday, October 21st, again at 7 p.m., 
for our next IBJI and NSYMCA Education Series program hosted by Dr. Brian McCall entitled Shoulder Pain, Injuries, Prevention, and Treatment. Thank you again for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dr. Michael Q, for your time and effort in putting together this presentation to teach us about hip, hip arthroscopy. Now, doctor, please take it from here. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Very good. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about hip arthroscopy, um, uh, an area in orthopedics and particularly sports medicine and hip preservation that has really bloomed in the last 15 years. Um, a really exciting time with the things that we can do arthroscopically. My disclosures can be seen on the Academy, Orthopedic Academy website, uh, nothing relevant to this talk. A joint is a place where the ends of the bone meet and the hip joint is where the pelvis is connected to the thigh and where the femoral head is connected to the acetabulum in an articulation forming a ball and socket joint. The femoral head is the ball and the acetabulum is the socket. Our joints are covered with a small, uh, with a smooth white uh, soft tissue material called articular cartilage. And in the hip, the acetabulum and the femoral head both have articular cartilage that cushions the bones and allows the joint to move smoothly and without pain. In addition to the articular cartilage, the hip acetabulum is lined with the labrum. The labrum of the hip is a soft cartilaginous structure that is flexible and serves several functions in the hip joint, including formation of a suction seal on the femoral head. The hip uh, joint capsule is also is comprised of strong ligaments that help stabilize the joint and a smooth inner lining called the synovium creates a, uh, the synovial fluid that is within the joint and allows for frictionless movement uh, and reduces joint wear. The ligamentum teres is a ligament on the inside of the joint itself that tethers the femoral head to the acetabulum directly uh, and does provide some blood flow to the area. Finally, <clears throat> the muscles and tendons surrounding the hip, thigh, and pelvis power the hip joint, allowing it to move. And this is what hip arthroscopy basically looks like. Arthroscopy surgery, also known as arthroscopy or simply a scope, so a hip scope is a surgical procedure uh, where we treat problems within the joint. A scope is a flexible fiber optic tube that contains a small camera and the lighting system that connects uh, to the camera and illuminates the structures inside the joint onto a screen. Um, and then we can visualize and treat uh, problems within the hip joint. And so hip arthroscopy or a hip scope is a surgery in which we visualize, diagnose and treat problems of the hip joint. Hip arthroscopy started in the 1930s uh, with the first mention of a cadaveric study uh, and then a clinical report in the 19, uh, in 1939. However, in 1980s, hip uh, arthroscopy in general took off in popularity as a minimally invasive procedure and arthroscopic diagnosis and treatment of hip pathology grew. Up until this time, many disorders that we now currently treat non-surgically or even with surgery, whether we're talking a hip arthroscopy or an open procedure, were previously unknown or undetected, and therefore they went untreated. Now hip preservation is a well-established and growing field. And today, <clears throat> many of the hip procedures that used to be performed under open surgery um, with large incisions, uh, many of these uh, requiring to dislocate the hip or disarticulate the hip to do work, can be performed now through arthroscopy, through tiny keyhole incisions. So um, this is an example of a large open hip surgery incision compared to poke hole or keyhole incisions that can be used to perform uh, much of the same work that we used to require open surgery to do years ago. This is less morbid to the patient, less traumatic, 
um, it facilitates easier recovery as well. So the most common condition that we treat with hip arthroscopy is femoroacetabular impingement and labral tears. Femoroacetabular impingement is a painful syndrome caused by morphologic hip characteristics that give rise to premature contact between the acetabulum and the socket, uh, between the, the socket and the ball or the acetabulum and the femur during hip movement, especially during activities at the extremes of range of motion. FAI can lead to progressive damage within the hip joint, including the acetabular labrum, cartilage, and ultimately it can lead to secondary arthritis of the hip. Therefore, identification and treatment of FAI is important, has been shown to improve quality of life in patients treated early in the disease process. So what is hip impingement? There's several types of hip impingement. The pincer impingement refers to a socket or acetabular base disorder where there is an excessively deep socket restraining normal hip range of motion. This can be due to a globally uh, deep socket such as with conditions called acetabular protrusio or coxa profunda or more focally overgrowth in the front or in certain other areas of the acetabular rim where the femoral head is overcovered um, by the acetabular rim. And this is the most common type of pincer impingement. It's usually seen in middle-aged females, again, where there's overhead, over, overhang over the femoral head. And it can also be seen with acetabular retroversion, which is basically the socket rotated to be facing backwards instead of facing forwards, like in uh, most normal hips. Cam impingement, this is uh, referring to the ball side of the joint. So the femoral head has a bump near the head and neck junction that distorts the normal round globe-like shape of the femoral head. And this limits the amount of hip flexion during, uh, during activities and basically causes that cam to abut and pinch or impact into the acetabular socket. Usually this is the kind seen in young athletic males with a decreased ratio of head to neck offset or step off. We see loss of femoral head sphericity in this condition. And we can also see it in conditions where the femoral neck, instead of facing forward, which is known as femoral antiversion, uh, the neck faces backwards or retroversion instead of pointing forward. And this can be seen in uh, certain disease conditions like uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis in pediatric patients uh, that eventually uh, grow up into adults um, or even just in the normal version of a certain individual based on their morphology. Subspine impingement refers to an extra articular, so outside the joint condition uh, that can contribute to hip pain with or without impingement in, within the joint as well. It results from abnormal contact between the anterior inferior iliac spine, or the AIIS, and the femur. Extreme or repetitive hip flexion results in impingement of these soft tissues on the front side of the hip joint, more commonly one of the quadriceps tendons near the hip and the anterior, or again, the front hip capsule and the anterior labrum as well. But most commonly, we see a combination of two or three of these in a combined impingement scenario, um, and this is the most common again. So patients, how do they present with uh, FAI or labral tears? They can present with hip or groin pain with activity, but even at rest. They may describe pain with sitting or leaning forward in a seated position, like at school or on an airplane. Uh, twisting or changing directions during activities, even pain with sexual intercourse. They can describe mechanical symptoms where the hip feels like there is something that is catching uh, with movement and then it wiggles free and then the hip feels like it's allowed to move freely again. And they can also have gluteal or trochanteric pain, that pain that can happen on the side of the hip uh, on the outside of the leg there, and this can lead to altered mechanics as a secondary problem to an internal or intra-articular problem in the hip joint itself. And sometimes patients come in and they describe a C sign, which will be demonstrated by this patient here, 
where they make a C and they put it on the outside of their hip there, describing the radiation of pain from the front all the way around into the back of the hip. And that's a positive C sign as described by this patient here. So on physical examination, they usually uh, describe pain with hip flexion, uh, a, a test called the labral stress test, or the fader exam uh, for anterior impingement, where we bring the hip and the leg up into flexion, adduct the hip towards the center of the body, and internally rotate the hip. And this elicits pain, especially if there's a labral tear in that region. There's also numerous other examination findings that we can look for, and we'll show a few videos of these. So this is the fader exam. We bring the hip up into flexion and internally rotate as we adduct the leg towards the center in varying degrees of hip flexion there. And you'll see that this patient negates pain when we externally rotate the hip, but when we internally, that's when that brings on pain. That's a positive fader sign. Next, we have the labral stress test. This is where we bring the leg out into abduction and flexion, adduction, and internal rotation to see if the uh, morphologic characteristics of that hip lead to pain in the anterior superior labrum. The Faber test, this is where we flex, flex the knee, abduct, and externally rotate, and patients can have tightness or pain in the front of their hip with this maneuver and in this patient, you can see that the way the knee sits off the table on the contralateral normal hip, it's much lower to the table. Uh, that's a positive Faber test right there where um, there's tightness and resistance of the leg to, to go down towards the table because of pain. Next, we have the Stinchfield test where we flex the hip and ask them to resist uh, by lifting their leg up against resistance, pain in the front of the hip is positive, and this can be significant for an anterior labral tear. Posterior impingement, this is where we abduct and externally rotate the leg to see if there's a tear in the posterior aspect of the hip um, that could possibly be uh, aggravated by this maneuver. And sometimes we have to stabilize the pelvis by asking the patient to support the contralateral leg like so in order to prevent uh, compensatory pelvic shifting during the examination process. We check for general hip range of motion with adduction and abduction to get a general sense of the range of motion of the hip in question. And the circumduction, this is a test for internal snapping where the iliopsoas, which is a tendon that comes from the lower uh, lumbar spine and the pelvis, comes forward over the hip joint itself and then attaches onto the area of the femur called the lesser trochanter. And this can cause snapping of the tendon over the hip joint that can lead to pain. So this is a positive internal snapping hip uh, syndrome test, in this case, a positive circumduction test. The Thomas test for iliopsoas tightness. This is a test where we assess for contractures of that iliopsoas, um, which can be elicited during an examination maneuver shown here, uh, where we ask the patient to lift the contralateral hip and leg up. And if you see the leg sitting off the table like that uh, and tight when we try to bring it into extension, uh, that's a positive Thomas test. Next, we look radiographically at the patient. Um, in this particular case, this is an AP pelvis, uh, a two-dimensional image taken with the x-ray shot from the front of the patient towards the back. And there are certain parameters that we look for on radiographs, including on this AP pelvis, that give us information about the hip itself and uh, things that can go wrong uh, or lead to pain in the hip. So one thing we look for, this is the anterior wall of the left hip there, and that's the front side of the socket. Then we mark out the posterior wall, which is the red line there. 
and these two lines aren't supposed to cross on a good uh, AP pelvis uh, x-ray. Um, this is indicative of one of several things. It could be that this hip is retroverted, which in, case, in this case it is a little bit, but it's also a uh, finding that can be consistent with over coverage of the hip by the socket or a pincer lesion in the front of the hip with a positive crossover sign like this. And that's the act, uh, center of the axis of rotation of the femoral head. And whenever this lies outside the hip socket, as we see here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, lying just lateral to the posterior wall or that red line there, uh, this could be uh, indicative of several things. Um, and this should cue you in that this socket may be hypovolemic or not have a lot of volume, or that the socket is significantly retroverted. Um, which in this case, it is retroverted a little bit. These are called ischial spine signs where we, we see the spines pointing inwards towards the pelvis, another indication that the acetabulum is retroverted in this patient. We can look at a measurement called the acetabular index. Uh, this is normally uh, seen up to 80, uh, 38 degrees. Uh, beyond that, we consider the hip to be dysplastic there's other parameters that we look for hip dysplasia, not just the acetabular index, including the lateral center edge angle um, seen here, which normally goes between 25 to 39 degrees. And this one is just, you know, at the bottom uh, uh, value of normal in that range. There's three other radiographs that we obtain, and this is another uh, patient and we obtain these radiographs because, again, they tell us things that other radiographs don't tell us. We have the modified Dunn view, the false profile view, and the lateral view of the hip. And on the false profile view there, we see the anterior aspect of the hip or the front of the hip and how much coverage there is there. Uh, this angle should be 20 to 40 degrees, and this one is beyond 40 degrees there, again, indicating anterior overcoverage of the socket at this joint. This is called an alpha angle. We measure this on the modified Dunn view, which uh, puts on FOSS the uh, cam lesion that can exist on a femur. And this alpha angle is normal under 50 degrees or under 46 degrees, according to some studies. Um, beyond that uh, is considered abnormal, and this is an abnormally high alpha angle. And this tells us how much of that cam needs to be resected in order to get a good decompression and what we call a femoroplasty, where we shave off the cam uh, bump on the femur. MRI certainly has a role in the workup and diagnosis of FAI and labral tears. And this is an example of a MRI obtained before and then after gadolinium contrast was injected uh, in a 23-year-old female. Uh, before and after she also exercised. And you can clearly see the accentuated labral tear on the right, um, not as clearly seen on the left. This is also beneficial in uh, elucidating uh, cartilage injuries in the hip uh, when there's uh, contrast uh, in the hip joint to further light up the joint. However, uh, with contrast injected, there's a slightly higher false positive rate for labral tears. And so that's definitely something to consider uh, when ordering these exams. CT scan with 3D reconstruction can be quite helpful in the uh, surgical planning uh, for patients and further define bony abnormalities specific to each patient um, as each hip is different. It can properly account for things like pelvic obliquity uh, to provide true values and measurements of acetabular orientation or version like we talked about before. can give us information about anterior overcoverage or a pincer deformity, certainly the femoral cam deformity, and even potentially subspine impingement area uh, between the AIIS and the acetabular rim. On the image on the left side of the screen there, you see a significant cam deformity that is noted on the femur from the one o'clock to three o'clock position there. Compare this to another CT scan of another patient where there is no cam between the one and three o'clock position on a similar right hip. 
So this would help visualize this cam deformity and where it's located. Again, from one to three o'clock, the prominence there is quite obvious. On the other side, so the left side, the right side of the screen, we are looking at a left hip joint or the socket of the joint called the acetabulum with the conventional description of the clock face shown here, even for left hips, the convention is 12 o'clock is directly superior. And then as we move forward or towards the front of the hip, we go to one, two and three o'clock and so on. Non-surgical management for hip impingement and labral tears includes a number of things, observation uh, or tactical, uh, tactful neglect, Certainly activity modification has a role uh, where you avoid inciting activities like prolonged sitting or twisting or specific exercises. Patients can take anti-inflammatories, whether we're talking prescription or over the counter. Certainly physical therapy plays a major role in non-surgical management and injections. Uh, these can be used uh, as diagnostic as well as therapeutic uh, purposes. Um, and it can include things like cortisone or platelet-rich plasma. Surgical management and what we're here to talk about tonight, hip arthroscopy, the indications include failure of non-surgical management and mechanical symptoms when the patient presents. Outcomes with hip arthroscopy have been shown to be equivalent long-term uh, when compared to open hip surgery, but obviously hip arthroscopy is less morbid, less traumatic, um, than open hip surgery, and hip arthroscopy can possibly prevent the uh, development of secondary hip osteoarthritis if performed correctly to remove all the inciting factors and impingement and repair the labrum appropriately or even reconstruct the labrum. There's some literature that also supports hip arthroscopy to be more clinically effective than even the best non-surgical care. So this is the patient positioning for a hip arthroscopy. This is a right hip arthroscopy that we'll be doing. You see the uh, x-ray machine position there just above the patient's hip with the laser line pointed down um, and the legs of the patient abducted in order to uh, facilitate surgery. And the next step after we properly position and we get ready for surgery, is to distract the hip joint so that we can gain access to it with our portals and our camera and do the, the work that we need to do. So this is an example of a hip distraction in the OR. And you see that give that the hip demonstrates there and that's the loss of the suction seal when the hip is pulled out or distracted and you see a positive vacuum sign there, the white on the left x-ray compared to the right before we distract the hip. That's a positive or a vacuum sign, and we need to see distraction like this or a little bit less in order to do hip arthroscopy. So hip arthroscopy um, portals, I generally perform most of my hip scopes through two portals. Sometimes uh, more than two portals are needed depending on the findings uh, at the time of surgery and the specific procedures that are required. Um, these portals are performed uh, and, and placed under uh, x-ray visualization to help guide their placement uh, into the appropriate area. There's a number of portals that can be used, and this is a diagram that can demonstrate that. So here's the sequence of obtaining our portals and using x-rays. The steps we distract and access the joint by establishing our portals. Then we evaluate the joint. We perform what's called an intraportal capsulotomy where we make a cut in between the uh, two portals. Um, that's called an intraportal capsulotomy. Some individuals perform an even bigger capsulotomy, but I find it's, it's uh, usually not necessary in most hip scopes, um, but it is a uh, surgeon preference. Next, we debris the capsule and remove any loose bodies. Uh, possibly debris the ligamentum teres and other uh, procedures. We elevate the capsule off of the labrum and off of the socket, the acetabulum. And then we get to do uh, part of the real work, which is decompressing the hip. So we remove the pincer or the subspine areas of impingement. We do this under x-ray. 
Then once the uh, socket is prepared, we put our anchors in the socket and perform a labral repair by reattaching the labrum onto the acetabular rim. We check to make sure that the labral repair has a good suction seal um, at the time of surgery. And then we uh, let the hip uh, go back into uh, normal positioning. And we typically take the leg through um, a number of uh, positions and, and uh, uh, varying degrees of flexion and internal or external rotation to get a good idea of what the cam really looks like, uh, the, uh, mark it out and then resect it. And the highest uh, or most common reason for failed hip arthroscopy is inadequate cam resection. So this is very important to remove all the necessary impingement. Once we remove it, we, we do a dynamic assessment of the hip to make sure that the impingement has been removed possibly do an iliopsoas release if indicated, and the indications for this are, are uh, very limited um, and there aren't very good, um, well-defined indications. And uh, in my practice, I've gone away from doing a lot of uh, iliopsoas uh, submuscular releases, whereas in fellowship, we used to do a number of them. And then finally, we close the capsule and get out of the OR. So this is what it looks like. We get our first X-ray. We distract the hip joint. We obtain the anterolateral portal or the first uh, viewing portal. And then we establish a secondary portal more anteriorly directly under visualization with our camera. Um, and then we get to assessing the joint itself. So this is a right hip and we're looking towards the front of the hip and you see a nice uh, labral tear there that's pretty obvious. There's uh, fraying and uh, abnormal uh, movement of the labrum as it's getting peeled off the acetabular socket there. So that's a labral tear right around the uh, 1.30 to 2 o'clock position right there. Next we perform our debridement um, and in this process we can remove flaps of cartilage like you see on the top there before and after removal of an unstable cartilage tear. We can remove loose bodies as well. And next, we get to the acetabuloplasty portion of the case. Uh, this is where we remove the pincer. So plasty means to reshape, and acetabuloplasty is to reshape the acetabulum. And we're looking above the hip joint here. The labrum is to the uh, four to five o'clock position there on the uh, screen and we're resecting the pincer lesion and here the subspine region. We already did a, a, a number, a good amount of the resection, um, but we're just adding finishing touches now. And as we go along and we do this acetabuloplasty and subspine resection, we check with x-rays to make sure that we're uh, not fooling ourselves and we're actually indeed removing the portions of the hip that are leading to uh, pain and impingement. So this is us checking x-ray there, checking x-ray here, checking x-ray in another position. And if we're not satisfied with the appearance, then we, you know, go back and do some more resecting uh, as appropriate to perform a good decompression of the subspine or even the acetabulum. Next, uh, we look at the labrum once again. And this is right around the 1230 position, and that's one o'clock, 130, right where the labral tear was on the assessment. This is the same hip. You see the labrum is stable there, but more towards the front where we cleaned it up a little bit, it, uh, it's unstable. So we place our anchors in the socket. We pass our suture in and around the labrum. This is a circumferential repair. Another type of repair can be where you pass the suture through and through the labrum, it's called the labral base repair. And this circumferential repair there is tightened down and the labrum is secured onto the acetabular rim there for a real nice looking and uh, stable repair. Then we release the distraction on the hip and we check our suction seal. So you'll see the femoral head going back into the joint. And now we, we pull it out again and you see there's a good suction seal especially when we let the hip rest there in the hip for a little bit, like right now. Real good suction seal that tells us that we've restored that function of the labrum 
through our labor repair. And after we do the labor repair, we get to the peripheral compartment where we perform our CAM osteoplasty or femoroplasty. This is a video of that. The CAM uh, decompression portion, again, is really important because it's the most common reason to return to the OR due to inadequate uh, resection of the CAM leading to uh, pain and a secondary hip arthroscopy. And we really want to do a good job of going all the way down the femoral neck like we're doing here and we're checking under x-ray to find any remaining bumps along the neck like we see here. And we really decompress the entire femoral head down to the neck. So at the starting at the femoral head neck junction all the way down the neck uh, to perform an appropriate femoroplasty. Otherwise, uh, the patient may fail uh, the labor repair that we spent so much time doing before. So we check it radiographically as we go. And then, you know, this is what a femoroplasty would look like when we're done. In surgery, uh, the top left there, you see the red outline. Uh, this is a patient with a, a right hip arthroscopy. Um, and uh, we, uh, we already started the camera section there, but this was the best picture I could find. And you can see the uh, bump that's abnormally uh, shaped and found on the femoral head neck uh, region. And then the blue line outlining the resection of that cam uh, through a femoral plasty back to a normal appearing head neck junction to decompress the hip and not allow the cam to uh, impinge against the repaired labrum. Do we have time for a case example? I don't know what, how we're doing on time. No, I think we have time. I, okay. I mean, how long do you think it'll take? Maybe uh, 10 minutes max. Yeah, I think we're good. So this is a 42-year-old female that came to see me with uh, insidious onset of hip pain in the front and the side, so the lateral aspect of the hip for five months. She described a positive C sign, again, pointing to that area. No prior hip history, mild relief with physical therapy and anti-inflammatory uh, course. Uh, we gave her a, a, an injection uh, in the bursa on the outside of the hip, and that helped resolve the lateral pain, but not the pain in the groin or the anterior hip. We also provided her with an iliopsoas injection because of her examination. And this provided 50% of her relief, but still not complete. She's uh, five foot three inches, 134 pounds. On exam, she has a positive fader impingement, positive labral stress test, positive Faber sign for iliopsoas uh, derived pain. And this is again with the leg elevated off the exam table in that figure of four position for a tight psoas that's impinging on the anterior capsule and possibly the labrum and certainly a positive circumduction test for internal snapping cues us in that there's something going on with the psoas that's leading to this uh, pain syndrome. And she also had tight hamstrings. This is her uh, radiographs here. We've gone over the uh, AP pelvis on this particular patient before where we see the crossover sign, a uh, positive poster wall sign with the axis of rotation outside of the uh, poster wall there positive ischial spine signs, lateral center edge angle, uh, indicating that she's not overcovered laterally, but certainly anteriorly. There is overcoverage as we see on the false profile view there with a prominent subspine. And on the uh, femoral, on the uh, modified done view, there's uh, no cam really on here. Uh, th that angle is well below uh, 50 degrees. So. Having failed prolonged physical therapy, the iliopsoas injection um, and the uh, trochanteric injection, she elected to proceed with hip arthroscopy. And my primary goal for uh, most patients, and especially in this one, is to minimize pain and help the patient return to their desired activities. So my approach to thinking about this particular case uh, in this hip is to consider all the inciting factors and how I can address everything needed from the biomechanical standpoint where she has anterior overcoverage or a pincer deformity with some retroversion of the hip of the acetabulum, uh, the acetabulum of the hip and uh, no cam in this particular patient, at least on radiographs. And this is likely leading to her acetabular labrum to be pinched and torn as it is compressed under a tight 
iliosoleus that runs over the front of the hip there. And uh, again, an obvious and clear source of her pain as she had 50% improvement. So I'm anticipating biological signs of anterior capsular impingement, possibly a labral tear and irritation. We get an MRI and you can clearly see a, a finding suggestive of a labral tear there. This is on the uh, axial cuts on the right side and on the coronal cuts there. You see some irregularity that's suggesting that uh, there's uh, something going on. Um, the low-dose CT scan with three-dimensional reconstruction, you see no real significant cam lesion on the femur there. But look at the left side of the hip there, you see how retroverted that acetabulum is. The socket is retroverted with the front being uh, towards the top of the slide. And watch where the axis of rotation falls of the femoral head well outside that, that line. And so if we resect the front or the anterior acetabular rim back to where that red line is, this hip will become an unstable hip and, and then you got other problems to work with. So at the time of hip arthroscopy, um, there was significant anterior capsular and corresponding labral uh, redness or erythema uh, and induration that all points towards capsular impingement as we discussed, was expected to go along with the tight iliosoas derived pain. And there was labral instability with delamination of the cartilage or carpet sign we see there on the right, where the cartilage bubbles off the acetabular socket. This is a positive carpet sign or wave sign uh, in some uh, literature reports. And this is around the one o'clock position in, the, in this left hip, just to give you reference. So this carpet sign of chondral delamination is usually more commonly seen with significant CAM lesions, but this patient didn't have a CAM. Next, we perform our pincer resection or acetabuloplasty, and we see how the pincer has been resected there. We do an under fluoroscopic imaging to make sure we don't overdo it, and we do the right amount, and good surgical planning is important, especially in cases like this where it's not quite straightforward. Next, we repair the labrum. And following repair, we check the suction seal to be restored. The second biomechanical factor uh, corrected that can cause pain. And then the femoral head was examined uh, and the neck, and it did not reveal any significant cam lesion uh, at the time of surgery. The last step is to release the iliopsoas, uh, which, again, I hesitate to do on patients uh, uh, like this, where you're resecting a pincer, they already have a retroverted and slightly hypovolemic hip, um, but we did just the right amount so that we don't destabilize her and this psoas tendon is clearly a source of pain. So before and after release, they're uh, all done uh, through poke hole incisions. Uh, rehab after surgery, we protect uh, uh, the patient with protected weight bearing and a brace and activity modification to allow for soft tissue healing. Then after that, they return to pain-free uh, ambulation or walking without gait compensation. And then they progress to the third phase, which is strengthening, endurance training, and ultimately to return to sports and high-level activities. This usually takes about five to six months. In this particular patient, uh, she had resumed all desired athletic activities of daily living without any impairment or pain in that left hip after five months from surgery. And even now, years from this surgery, she's not returned to the office to, to let me know that she has uh, any pain in that hip. And I think that this is because we've addressed all the hip pathology and inciting factors for pain, the biomechanical, the biological uh, factors, and we have to tailor each surgery specifically to the patient's morphology and uh, needs. And this comes through good history, physical examination, radiographic evaluation, advanced imaging with MRI, and even possibly CT scan, and then well-executed surgery in the end. So to put it all together, this is a video from uh, this patient's left hip with voiceover. This is a left hip arthroscopy with the labor being examined, showing a little bit of instability, and with the cartilage beneath it bubbling. There's also some redness at the front of the hip at the labrum, which signifies impingement. The labrum is released from the soft tissue attachments and the overlying capsule, 
and upon re-examination, the carpet sign is accentuated, showing the cartilage that is bubbling off the socket side of the joint. Next, the socket side of the hip is decompressed in order to remove what is known as a pincer lesion. When this bone overgrows into the hip joint, it can cause tearing of the labrum, and the pincer lesion is decompressed incrementally. Following this decompression, sutures are passed in and around the labrum, and the labrum is anchored back onto the socket for a stable repair. And then one more video um, to demonstrate uh, a pretty substantial labral tear uh, requiring four anchors. Um, this is uh, a labral repair on a left hip um, repaired with four anchors. This is another patient that's around the two o'clock, one o'clock position right there. And then right around the 1230 position there, you see a little bit of that wave sign or the carpet sign. And there's that labral tear right there towards the front. So we pass our anchors, uh, put our anchors in, pass the suture, tighten up the anchors for a nice labral repair from the two o'clock to 1230 position there on the acetabulum, nice stable repair. This patient's also doing great. Thank you for your time and attention. Any questions? And thank you for, for your time. Yes, we do have questions. So are you ready? Do you need uh, anything to sit before you? Uh... Let's All right. do it. Okay. Um, so there's a question from Judith, and she says, um, I'm going to reword her question just a little bit. Um, for someone who doesn't have anything pre present until they get involved in sports activities in their young adult lives, are those anomalies then usually congenital for someone who doesn't present until they start doing activities as a young adult? Yeah, so uh, very complex question, and there is controversy on this. Um, certainly there are elements that patients are born with that then predispose them to have um, hip impingement um, and certainly the activities that patients undertake throughout their lifetime um, you know can lead to problems um, one way that I like to explain certain things to patients involving this is um, you know you were given a certain uh, a certain card set, you know, certain characteristics in life, and you want to play, for example, basketball, um, but you're not six feet tall and you don't have much of a shot. So then you need to find something else to do, or we need to fix the problem of being not six feet tall and not having a good shot. And certainly when it comes to hip impingement, you know, there's some morphologic features that we can repair or, or uh, decompress and fix arthroscopically. Some of them we cannot um, just based on the parameters and um, and and other times the patients can choose to let go of certain activities that uh, bring on the pain um, you know like dancing where they they're moving their legs above their head in positions that were uh, that are really extreme and uh, causing causing impingement um, and then the uh, other side of that coin is also, uh, b besides the fact that some patients are born with certain characteristics, they can certainly develop um, throughout uh, their adolescent uh, time period based on stressors. Um, one example that I gave during the talk is a pediatric patient that can have a slipped capital femoral epiphysis, and that's where the uh, very top of the femoral head slips through the growth plate out of position almost like a fracture through the growth plate it slips and then that'll cause an abnormal cam deformity at the head and neck junction uh, once the patient has reached skeletal maturity and that can lead to impingement as well so there's conditions like that there's also uh, conditions that aren't really uh, a disease process uh, identified like a skiffy um, but certainly can lead to morphologic change as patients develop into from adolescence into adulthood. Got it. Thank you. Great explanation. Um, Haley asks, long term, is there any increased risk of arthritis after femoroplasty? 
So <clears throat> the risks with femoroplasty don't typically um, lead, don't, you know, a properly done femoroplasty uh, usually doesn't lead to uh, hip arthritis in and of itself. Um, there's other things that it can lead to. Um, for example, if you over resect aggressively, that can lead to a femoral neck fracture, and that's another problem entirely. Um, and so, you know, over um, over resection is a problem. Under resection leads to repeat impingement and re tears of the labrum that we've seen in the literature. But a properly done femoroplasty, to my knowledge, I've not seen any literature to suggest that this in and of itself leads to hip osteoarthritis. It's usually an inadequate uh, femoroplasty that, that leads to further impingement and then osteoarthritis. And in fact, there's even uh, studies in um, young athletes that show if a femoroplasty was not performed to under 50 degrees on the alpha angle uh, to about 46 degrees, so it's, if it's not performed to that extent, um, those athletes, didn't return as readily to sports as the athletes that did have proper decompression due to various factors, uh, both in terms of uh, time to return to sport, symptoms with returning to sport, um, and other uh, factors. Great, thank you. Um, Mark asks, and I'll kind of combine this with Ron's question as well, are you able to remove arthritis using an arthroscopy appro approach, and will the arthritis grow back? And I think you just kind of answered that, but I figure I'll I'll, I'll ask their, their yeah. questions. So arthritis, by definition, is inflammation of the joint. So certainly we can reduce or remove inflammatory uh, or inciting factors. But in the general term of arthritis, where we're talking about loss of cartilage uh, that eventually leads to bone-on-bone -bone rubbing, that cannot be removed arthroscopically. And actually, there's uh, literature that shows that if a hip arthroscopy is performed on in the, an individual uh, who has hip arthritis um, or even moderate amount of arthritis uh, or early arthritis, that arthritis can accelerate after hip arthroscopy. Mm -hmm. So not only is it uh, not beneficial to try to remove arthritis arthroscopically, um, but it can accelerate the disease process. So in, in, in general terms, no, you cannot, but certainly, you know, focal areas of cartilage defect, like I said, you know, the flaps of cartilage in the pictures that we showed, you know, that's beneficial to, to debris those areas so that they stop causing uh, pain and symptoms. Excellent, thank you. And that makes a lot of sense. So for someone who has arthritis, that's more of a hip replacement, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. great, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, let me see. This one says, my husband had a hip replacement seven years ago and is experiencing pain in his hip and says that his hip feels like it's out of joint. This isn't really hip arthroscopy related, is it? Well, so it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, a number of my colleagues and um, other uh, physicians who are not part of IBGI have sent me patients who have had hip replacement surgery and then continue to have certain symptoms, uh, whether immediately afterwards or even years down the line. And a common uh, condition that can be seen, and I don't know if this is, again, we cannot talk to specifics about this patient exactly. without a thorough evaluation. Um, um, a lot of the times we see, even with uh, the anterior hip uh, replacements that are in vogue these days, um, the surgeon will cheat the positioning of the cup to be a little bit more retroverted, but that leads to cup overhang over the front of the bony anatomy of the patient. And what rides right over that area is the iliopsoas. And so uh, on several patients now, um, I have performed hip arthroscopy on a replaced joint to just go in there and release the iliopsoas tendon, which can snap over the front of the hip prosthesis. So it's a iliopsoas impingement, not in a native joint, but in an artificial joint that leads to pain. And uh, this can be an inciting factor after hip replacement, but you know, proper workup is needed for this. Thank you, that's, that's a great explanation and, and thank you for helping us understand that. 
Um, let's see. Uh, I was just reading this one from Jenny. I have a lot of questions, but I think I'll follow up with my primary care doctor first. I've had an x-ray and proper physical therapy for my hip pain. After seeing this, I believe I need to make a follow-up appointment with my doctor. Thank you. So I think it's nice to hear that, you know, when people come to these things, they actually get something out of it and realize, yeah. oh, I've learned something and I, I'm going to go follow up. Um, so uh, it, sa it says here, do you have any specific tips from Haley on choosing a surgeon for hip arthroscopy? I'm located out of state and trying to decide between two different surgeons that I've seen who have slightly different treatment plans. I mean, obviously, you need to do your due diligence, go online, um, you know, read up on their qualifications. Um, you know, you want to make sure that uh, your hip arthroscopist um, has good training and uh, you know, it's hard to tell if they know how to do a proper hip arthroscopy, but hopefully, you know, if they had the proper training and, you know, their results speak for themselves, that can put you at ease. Great, great. And someone else asks, Timothy asks, why did hip arthros arthroscopic surgery take nearly 40 years to be effective as a solution to injury and pain when knee surgery was already common in the early 80s? Yeah, so hip arthros uh, arthroscopy took off in the 80s, and certainly the knee um, was uh, one of the first up-and-comers. The hip, um, a lot of the pathology we didn't understand at the time uh, for hip impingement. People would get a standard AP pelvis radiograph, not see uh, things that were uh, looking abnormal, and the patients were told, you don't have hip arthritis um, you know, mm -hmm. just go on with your life. Um, with advancements in research and surgical techniques, you know, now hip arthroscopy is is a legitimate, um, you know, has a legitimate seat at the at the arthroscopy table. Excellent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You need to be able to diagnose before you can just start going around and, and treat. So the the better technology has enabled you to to have better access. Excellent. Okay, one more. Aaron says, I've heard about capsular plication. Is that how you pronounce that? P-L-I-C-A-T-I-O-N? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Done as part of the procedure. In what percentage of these hip arthros arthroscopies do you perform capsular plication? A low percentage. Um, so it depends what we specifically mean by capsular plication. When we talk about closure of the capsulotomy, um, if you repair that capsule end to end, that's called a capsular closure. But capsular plication could be either you're shifting one of the ends up relative to the corresponding other leaflet, or you're over repairing the, the capsule due to laxity in the capsule. So uh, there are times when I do capsular plication. Um, there's there's not you know uh, a whole bunch of literature out there on that topic. Um, it's it's uh, it's something that you know we consider as hip arthroscopists uh, in specific patients. Sometimes a patient that has very mild dysplasia um, and a very lax capsule, um, like you saw when I distracted that uh, right hip, the left hip, uh, in the demonstration. There was significant distraction there, and that's due to capsular laxity. And so that's a patient that uh, I actually did plicate the capsule to tighten them up a little bit, um, you know, not end to end, but a little bit uh, higher. Uh, it's hard to explain without demonstrating or going into more medical terms, but um, yeah. basically to tighten up that capsule, which is already lax, to hopefully give them a little bit more soft tissue. Uh, stability once the soft tissues have healed uh, after recovery. Got it. Got it. Great. Okay. Last question. Um, you had mentioned it was about five months to getting back to to your regular activities and and, and intense activities. So someone says, how long is recovery realistically to walk normally and exercise? And how many days post op do you typically have patients post op? Do you typically have patients start therapy? And you, you mentioned it briefly, but I figured that we'll kind of end on that so people can understand what happens following hip arthroscopy. 
Yeah, so I like to get patients into physical therapy right away. Um, I'm confident in the repairs that we do and the decompression, certainly with certain restrictions, um, but getting in the physical therapy right away is beneficial. Um, we use protected weight bearing for two weeks, typically, um, and then after that, the patient can start to progress weight bearing uh, and progress their gait till they get to a normal gait pattern. Another goal that I usually tell patients uh, postoperatively is you can typically run in a straight line three months after surgery, and then around five to six months is what it takes for uh, most individuals uh, following a successful hip arthroscopy to return to activities. Awesome. Dr. Q, thank you so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. I, I loved how thorough the videos were, your explanations were, um, and, and we had people stayed on the whole time, which is always a great sign. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Dr. Q, thank you so much for your time tonight. Everybody have a great evening and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.